the reading today is from John 12, verse 20 to 33, on page 1080 in the Church Bible. And now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies and produces many seeds, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my, my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others, others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. And now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray for Lee as he's going to bring this word to us now. Father, we do pray uh, that you will help us to receive the challenge of your word today. And Lord, that you will touch Lee's heart, Lord, that you will guide his lips that you'll speak into the message he's prepared, that it will become for us a living word today, sharp, living, active in our lives. So Lord, we do pray for your Holy Spirit to move in us and in Lee today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. Um, in my normal fashion, we're going to start with a... Um, with a little video clip. Um, now, when you watch this video clip, I want you um, to imagine, actually, sometimes when we read Scripture, we don't always get the point straight away. Sometimes we have to spend a little bit of attention, and we need to focus on it, and we need to listen, and we need to read, and we need to understand. But I would like to particularly encourage you, if, uh, if you are married, uh, if you have a, a serious relationship, if you're approaching marriage, this is a particularly uh, good video for you, but it's actually for, for all of us, so just watch this. We misunderstand uh, the Bible, and actually it's when we really, really get to grips with it, we see that actually sometimes there's more underneath the surface, and we're going to hopefully do that this morning. Um, if you haven't already, I'd encourage you to have your Bibles open, um, and some of the verses are going to come up on the, on the screen anyway, so uh, if you haven't got one, or you're one of these people that prefers to um, yeah, just stare forward or something. That's, that's totally fine as well. Now, this is, a, this is an interesting passage. Like I said, it's, it, there's a little bit more um, to it than first meets the eye. And uh, we start off with some, some Greeks. Now, uh, that reminded me of years ago, uh, I was at a Soul Survivor talk, and uh, Mike Pilavachi stood up. How many, anybody know Mike Pilavachi? He kind of heads up Soul Survivor, and yeah. And uh, he stood up, and he said, I've studied theology. He said, I even know a little Greek. And he then went on to say that the little Greek I know, his name's J. John, um, who's, a, who's a friend of his. So I thought that was, that, was his, um, that was how much Greek he actually knew. But um, these Greeks have approached uh, Andrew, and they want to they wanna talk to Jesus. Now, Andrew was a little bit 
disturbed almost by this, the way we kind of read it, because he didn't really know what to do. Um, so he came to Philip, um, and Philip didn't know what to do, so he went off and he spoke to Andrew. And I wonder why initially they came to Philip, because it got me thinking, it's like, wow, when people want to know about Jesus, do they come and approach me? Do they see something in me that makes them want to um, get to know Jesus? But the reason we believe, certainly if you read commentaries, is that actually Philip's name um, was Greek. His name potentially would have been Philippos. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of audience participation this morning. So, the count of three, I want you all to say Philippos. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, Brendan, you said that particularly well. Thank you. Okay, uh, no, some of you weren't trying hard enough, so we're going to try it. We're going to do um, over this side first. One, two, three. I'm going to do you this side last. Okay, we're going to do this side now. One, two, three. A little bit better. Okay, Brendan, you got this? Okay, one, two, three. Fantastic. I personally think this side did it better, but that doesn't matter. But the disciples, um, Philip went to Andrew. Now, you know, I've done this before. Somebody asked me a difficult question, not quite sure what to do, so I'll go and ask somebody else, um, usually my wife, um, if I don't know what to do. So we go and ask somebody else. And you know, maybe there was this little bit of nervousness because something Jesus had said to the disciples earlier, and I'm going to press this button, and it's Josh is going to miraculously make my... That's it, you see? Earlier on, Jesus had said this. He said, he sent the 12 apostles out with these instructions, don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Now, Gentiles were non-Jews. Um, so all of a sudden, you've got this bunch of Greek people who want to come and see Jesus and... Philip's probably remembering, well, Jesus told us not to go to them, but he didn't say anything about what if they come to us. So he didn't know, and I can kind of imagine the conversation that maybe he had with Jesus. It may have gone along the lines of, uh, excuse me, Jesus, um, I know you said about the whole thing with the, uh, with the Gentiles and, and everything, but you didn't actually give us any clear directions on what would happen if they came to us. Well, there's this bunch of them that have come to us, and we really don't know what to do. So, you know, what do you want us to do? Send them away? Do you want us to have a conversation with them? What, what do you want to do? And Jesus, as he so often does, appears to not answer the question. He goes what appears to be off on a complete tangent. And uh, instead of that, he, he, he goes on to something completely different. And let's have a, let's have a look at uh, Jesus' response. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Now, I can just imagine Philip's face at that point. Okay, not quite sure how that answers my question. Um, and what's he left with? But it's interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus does do that. I saw a few of you nodding when I said that Jesus tends to answer questions in a way that's a bit random. And I met with somebody this week um, who's a non-Christian at the moment. They're, they're well on their way. And um, they said to me, I'm reading through the New Testament. They says, why does Jesus answer things in such a difficult way? And I said, well, that's on first reading. Sometimes you need to just really, really read into it. And you realize actually he's kind of answering things, but in a slightly different way. But it's true, isn't it? Jesus does seem to have this way of answering without answering the direct question that he's been given. Jesus replied, uh, like we said, up there. But what, what was Jesus actually getting at? What was he saying? Now, actually, at the end of the passage, Jesus talks about all men being drawn to himself. So, actually, this was already beginning to happen, wasn't it? Yeah? People who were outside of the Jewish nation, outside of the Jews, were being drawn to Jesus. Now, I, uh, I read something this week. I'm not, I'm not a, a, a gardener. I'm not into anything, uh, anything like that at all. But I do like learning new things. Now, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this bit. Now, who can tell me? Okay, who can tell me what that is? Horse chestnut. That is the technical name. Well, actually, it's not the technical name. I can't even say the technical name. But it is a horse chestnut. But to the common man or woman, okay, not that women are common, of course, but, you know, what is that? A conquer. Now, how many of you can remember from your school days playing conquers? Come on, show of hands. Yeah, okay. How many of you were a little bit above the average conqueror? I was. 
okay, and you'd get the biggest and the baddest looking conkers. Soak the, who soaked them in vinegar? Yes, okay. Who baked them? Yeah, okay. Who, uh, who got in trouble for using shoelaces that were still decent pairs? Of, yeah, I did. Okay. But a conker can be used. It can be great fun. Yeah, I mean, in this day and age of health and safety, you know, we mustn't let the children hurt their little knuckles. I mean, you know. You know. But conkers, conkers are fun. But actually, is that what a conker's for? Did God think, you know what, I'm going to make that beautiful tree, I'm going to make it grow conkers, and then people can thread a little bit of string through it, and they can just go around whacking it onto another conker, and that will be the conker serving its purpose. No, 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 Will, it's not. It's really not. Okay? A conker is designed to actually fall off the tree, go into the ground, open out of the little prick, I don't know what the thing's called, that prickly thing it's in. Okay? It's actually they're meant to go back into the ground where it dies, Okay, and then actually what it produces, it starts off looking like that, that thing on the left, okay, and then eventually, after very, very many years, it grows into another tree. That's what it's meant to do, okay, just because we think it's fun to <laughs> smash them up so that they can't possibly create new life. But, but that's what, and that's what Jesus was saying. He was saying that by my, me dying, that will produce many new kernels, many new seeds, many new followers, and Jesus talks about being lifted up. Now, the reason Jesus was talking about lifted up was because his death was actually, he was lifted up. He was lifted up and he was placed on a cross. And we have it at the center of our church, don't we? You know, and I, I love that cross. I think it's a real focal point, but that's not what Jesus' cross would have looked like. It would have been a lot bigger than that, and it would have, had a, it would have been a lot more of a rugged piece of wood. Now, when Jesus said he was lifted up, a lot of people in, at the time would have understood something from something that Moses said. And uh, if we look back, uh, how many of you have read a lot of the New Old Testament? Okay, don't need to, brilliant. Okay, you've read. But one of the things that happened, I don't know if you remember the, the story where the, the people of uh, the children of Egypt, do you know what? We've got a lot in common with the children of Egypt because they loved to whinge and moan. Have you ever noticed that human beings have this tendency to whinge and I see some of you, I'm not going to mention that. Okay, we do, don't we? If there's two ways of looking at it, sometimes we'll see the difficulty in it and we'll moan about it. And it's like, sometimes we have to look at it differently. But the, the children of Israel have had all those amazing things. God had brought them out of Egypt. They'd done all the, all the plagues and all the kind of amazing things God had done. And, you know, then he rained down food from heaven. You know, they, they had it, like, amazingly. But they still managed to moan. And at one point, it sounds really harsh to us, but God sent snakes amongst them, poisonous snakes. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen that really, really cheesy film, uh, Snakes on a Plane. Um, these would have probably been those kind of snakes, the ones that are really nasty, and if they bite you, it's going to do you some harm. But this happened in the Old Testament. And Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him and have eternal life now, in the Old Testament, when the, when the children of Israel were, um, children were, that were bitten, they had to look up to a bronze snake on a pole to be saved. So the Jews and the people at the time would have had an understanding that when something's lifted up and you look to it to be saved, that the penny might have started to drop with some of them when they realized that actually Jesus went up on a cross and they were looking up to him even though he died. And when Jesus dies on the cross, he was literally lifted up. And actually, since Jesus' death, he has produced many, many more followers. When Jesus was on earth, how many followers did he have that we know of? There's a regular bunch of disciples talked about it. There were the 12, then there were the 72. There were the others who were kind of um, maybe the sort of tag along and sort of it kind of grew. But after Jesus died, there were many, many more. But what was what else was Jesus saying in this passage? Jesus then goes on to say something, doesn't he, quite difficult. He says, those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life will keep it for eternity. Now on surface reading it, this seems a bit strange, doesn't it? Those who care nothing for their life. Now I'm looking around this morning and, uh, and I'm seeing quite a, a fairly well-dressed bunch of people. Um, some of you have made considerably more effort than others. Um, 
But my, my attention is particularly drawn, let's have a look, to um, Thelma. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to stand up. And uh, she, he, Thelma looks very, very smart. Helen has got a lovely scarf, and she's got a, a it's cold in here, Helen, isn't it? Tonight? She's got a nice coat. Okay, but, and some of you, okay, some of you, like me, a little less effort, maybe. Okay, if I look at you, it's not because you've not made an effort, it, it's just because I'm just treading carefully. <laughs> okay, but Jesus isn't saying, you know, if you don't care about your life, so, you know, you don't bother with brushing your teeth and, you know, don't shower every day, it's a waste of water. And, uh, you know, you know what, don't, don't use deodorant or anything like that because that's just, it's just a waste of money. You could be tithing that money um, more, more appropriately. Jesus isn't saying we shouldn't care for our life. Jesus is doing a comparison. Now, when I, when I looked into this, I looked into several um, commentaries, and the one word they all come up with was comparison. Now, what does comparison mean? Who can tell me what comparison means? That's actually a, not, it's not a rhetorical question. What does comparison does, does that? That's the wrong one. Okay, comparison. Who can tell me what that means? Let's have a look. Let's have a look. The process or result of comparing or of being compared. Okay? This detailed comparison of the two systems helped me understand the differences. Now, that's a bit complicated, so we're going to do a comparison this morning. Charles, can you come up here, please? Come, come and stand next to me. Okay, we're going to do a, uh, a hands-on um, comparison. So come and stand there. In fact, no, stand up here. Come and stand up here. Okay, now, when you first look at the two of us, apart from two dashing gentlemen, Okay, yeah. What, what do you see? Let's, let's talk about the comparisons between the two of us. Handsome, One, strong, yeah, 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 yeah. So, round, so kind of, yeah, tan, yeah. White. Yeah. He's a lot smarter than me, what, up here or dressed? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. He's definitely dressed smarter than me, yeah. Any other comparisons? I'm, I'm pink, he's not. Okay, yeah. Any other comparisons? He's taller than me. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. She yeah. said it with a smile. She oh, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any, any others before we before we finish this bit? No. Okay, Charles. Thank you very much. You can sit okay. down again. That's it. You can yeah, sit down. Go back to sleep. Okay. But we can do comparisons in life, can't we? Okay, and that's what Jesus was doing. Jesus was saying that compared to loving me, compared to knowing me, compared to being in relationship with me. In comparison, I want you to think nothing of your life. Following me, knowing me, needs to be the most important thing in your life that you are passionate about and that you are doing. Now, if we're loving Jesus so much that in comparison our life actually means very little to us, that's going to look different, isn't it, for different one of us? Because we've all been called to different things. We've all been called to follow Jesus but we're called to follow him passionately. So that in comparison, actually the rest of life is unimportant to us. It doesn't mean we don't pay attention to it, but in comparison, loving Jesus should be the thing that's at the highest. Now before we move on, because it's, it's easy to do that when looking at, at scripture, let's ask ourselves a question. When it comes to passionately following Jesus, are we doing that? Or are we so keen on other things, and it's going to be different for different ones. If, are we so keen, or if we're working, are we so keen to be gaining that next bit of uh, promotion, to, to go from being uh, in the office to being a, to being a manager? Are we so keen um, from, from working in the school, you know what, I, I want to get to that next level, I want to be in charge of a department. Whatever it is, are we so keen to be improving ourselves at work? If it's in our homes, are we so keen to think, you know what, once we can get, you know, the, the conservatory done, everything's going to be, it's going to be much, much nicer. You know, once we, uh, once we have that room decorated, once we do, if anything else is taking up more of our time and more of our thoughts than Jesus, then actually we need to question that. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing some of these things, because some of these things are quite good. It can be practical to improve your house. It'd be being a bad steward, wouldn't it, if you just let it go to rack and ruin. But if it starts to consume us and it's taking up more of our time than Jesus, then it's not right. Now, I read something this week which really, really challenged me because uh, one of the ways I love to switch off, I love to read and I, and I love to watch a good, uh, a good box set on the TV. 
But I bought this, uh, this book in a Christian bookshop when I was away on holiday, and it was a, it was a one-pound classic, they're called, um, and it's by David Wilkers, Wilkinson. And he goes on to talk about things that pull us away from Jesus. And I went into it with a bit of a smug attitude, thinking, Do you know what, I really love Jesus, I, I spend a lot of time with Jesus, I try and tell other people about Jesus. Um, I don't have many things I didn't think which took up more of my passion and enthusiasm um, for Jesus. But then he started the, the, the paragraph or the, the chapter off with, television is an evil that pulls us away from God. And I just thought, wow. You know, I love watching television. But then he went on to say, and it's, it's true, actually, the television can, we can be so consumed by a program. It's not that there's pro- anything wrong with the program itself that we're watching. I mean, my favorite program at the moment, you never guess this. Who can guess what my favorite TV program is? No, I'm not asking you. <laughs> Go on, you'll never guess it. Uh, it's my second. Yeah. My favorite. No, it's not Loose Women, no. No, you'll know it's called the midwife. Okay, it's actually, uh, it's actually called the midwife. I don't know what it is about it, but I really, really love that program. It, and there's nothing better than not having seen it for a few weeks and then watch two of them in a row. It's just like, yeah, it's brilliant. Okay, that stays within the church. Uh, Josh, that's edited out of the recording. Okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, but actually, it, it got me thinking that sometimes we can spend more time doing things that actually aren't necessarily bad things. But then I looked at, actually, you know, when I spend, look how much time I spend with Jesus, you know, I could cut down the, the TV, and I could actually spend more time with Jesus. Um, and I thought, wow, that's, that's really spoken to me. So, like I say, on surface reading sometimes, we kind of think, yeah, well, I've got that bit, okay. Yeah, Jesus, I'm doing that, that's all good. But we need to allow ourselves to be challenged. Now, this is quite challenging, and... Um, it's quite, it's quite, there's a lot in this passage, but I'm not gonna, we're not going to look at the last part of the passage this morning because we're going to look at a little bit about why Jesus died. Now, you're probably all thinking, oh, we know that. We know why Jesus died because we sin, and uh, the only way we're going to enter into a relationship with God is through his, his sacrifice on the cross. And it, some of the Bible really, really is complicated, but Jesus came to die so that we could have that relationship with him. Now, I, I met with a group of people this week who are really struggling. They said, well, you know, why, why, why did Jesus do it that way? Why couldn't he have found another way? Why did, why did Jesus have to die so that, you know, we could enter into a relationship with God? You know, he's God Almighty. Why, why did he have to do things that way? And I think if, if most of us are honest, that probably we've all had that question in our heart at some point. It might have been before we were saved. It might have been... Uh, recently, we, we don't always know, do we? Okay, but something I do know, and I love this verse. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decision and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And one of the things that it's really easy to accept when you have that relationship with God is, do you know what? We don't need to have all the answers. If God does something, to me now as a, as a follower of Jesus, it's because that's the way God wanted to do it. And actually, I don't have a right to question God. God doesn't mind when we do question him because we're his children, but he doesn't have to do things the way that makes sense to us. He does things his way because that's how he's chosen to do it. And that's where the faith kicks in, doesn't it? And as we, as we sort of approach the end, here's, here's something I want you to take home and be challenged by, and maybe put into action this week. Are we living our lives in such a way that to anybody looking in, and I don't mean the colleagues at work or the people at the school gate or whoever, are people, I'm talking about the people closest to us as well. And that's where it really, it really does get challenging. Are we living in such a way that people look at us and think, wow, Jesus is the most important thing in their life. When I look at their life, I see something different. I can tell 
They're madly, madly in love. Now, one of the, the ways that this was hit home to me, I've got, um, I've got a brother-in-law. Uh, I've, got, I've got two brother-in-laws, actually, but one of them is the same age as me, and he's been single uh, since he was about 19. Okay, now that's a long time to be single, okay? And uh, he, he's done quite well for himself. He's got a job that he's good at and he really enjoys. He's bought a home um, and he lives, in a, he lives up in, in Lancaster. And we thought that for a very, very long time, that was going to be his life. He was going to be single. He was going to enjoy, you know, holidays and all the kind of thing you can do um, when you haven't got sort of family. But then he met Laura. Everything changed. He went from being this kind of bloke who kind of, you know, did whatever he wanted to whenever he wanted to kind of do it. And he suddenly fell in love. And we saw such a difference in him in so many different ways. Not, you know, he was a great bloke before, but everything was about Laura. He couldn't do enough for her. You know, everything she needed, he wanted to provide it. Every minute he had, and he's in Lancaster and she's in Manchester and he works long hours, but every available moment he wanted to spend with her. He wanted everybody to know about her. You know, he started using Facebook in a completely different way. Um, there's lots of pictures of her on there rather than, you know, rather than on just, uh, you know, holidays or different things he was doing. And that got me thinking that that's what we should be like with Jesus. Our lives should be so consumed with him that everybody that knows us should think, wow, do you know what? Steve, man, Steve, look at Steve, and I just see like so much passion for Jesus. When I, when I look at Viv, I think, wow, Viv just loves Jesus. It just oozes out of him. You know, when I see, when I see Brendan, it's just like, wow, the first thing I notice is he's just a man that just wants, wants to serve Jesus. And if our lives aren't like that, then we need to question the Jesus that we're following. Because Jesus says, unless we consider our lives, our priorities, what we want to do as nothing in comparison, then we're not really following him, are we? So what I want to challenge you to do is to, to go away this week and spend some time alone with God. You know, It might be that you need to think, I'm not going to watch Call the Midwife at the moment. I'm actually going to spend some time in Scripture. I'm going to pray and ask God... The way I'm living my life, is it the way you want it? Am I doing what you've called me to do? And the answer may come back, yes, actually. I'm, I'm in, I love what you're doing. It's what I've called you to do. But actually, we can make a few changes. Because Jesus has a habit of doing that. And I remember years ago, there was a, a, a pastor at my parents' church in Hightown. And he said, even people who serve God with their whole life, he said, sometimes we can be so consumed with the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work. Now think about that. We can be so consumed in our relationship with God and serving God, we forget who we're doing it for. So my challenge for you is to go away this week, spend time alone with God, have a bit of a health checkup. I don't know um, how many of you have hit the age of 40, but when I hit 40... Uh, I got a letter from the NHS uh, saying that they wanted me to go down and have a health check. So I went and they did all the blood pressure and heart and all the different things. It was a bit like, a, 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 it was like an MOT. Um, and I'll never forget it because I took my daughter with me because um, I had to pick her up from school, not because I was scared of needles or anything. Okay, then, and the nurse said to me, any, any, anything to report, any problems? And my daughter, who would have been... 10 at the time, turned around and said, yeah, he's really annoying. <laughs> and, and the nurse blessed her said, well, I'm really afraid there isn't anything we can do to treat that. <laughs> um, but I had to have this kind of physical checkup. And I think, how often do we have a spiritual checkup? How often do we actually look at our lives, ask God, God, what do you think of me? I know you love me. I know you sent Jesus to die for me, but am I living in a way that pleases you? And it might be you can do that on your own. It might be that you need to you know, have a word with somebody else and say, you know, I really want to do a, this kind of spiritual checkup. Can we pray together? Can we kind of do that? And you know, if you've not got anybody that you can do that with, I know you can uh, come and speak to Glynn, speak to your small group leaders. Um, if you're feeling really brave, you can come and speak to me. 
But it's good to do those kind of things where we're checking, are we living so that our lives are passionately following Jesus?